like the animal. <laughs> right, well your ideas with the thinking proved very beneficial. We won the account. Mr. Aubrey and I are taking the clients out for dinner tomorrow night. You should come. Oh, it's okay. I'm not really cool in that dating scene. I think people should actually be able to talk to one another, you know? Face to face? Huh? Oh, come on. What do you have to lose? What are the other places?
Hello. <laughs> Your next performer is one of the most eloquent and gracious speakers I've had the opportunity to work with in the last 10 years I've been coaching speech. Now Maggie competes in a category called extemporaneous reading, which basically asks her to memorize an entire novel. Now the extemporaneous part of her category happens 30 minutes before she actually gives a speech. She draws three slips that have different cuttings, she chooses one, and then spends the next 30 minutes writing an introduction, memorizing that introduction, and identifying the best, most artistic and authentic way to read the cutting she's chosen. Basically, every round of competition, Maggie gives a different speech. Sounds hard, doesn't it? Maggie's a pro. So much so that this year she took home the state championship in extemporaneous reading. That's not even the best part. <laughs> this makes her the first Fridley speaker in history to take home that championship. <laughs> I know, right? So with a bunch of speech mama pride, I would like to welcome our state champion giving her state winning speech from Marcus Zusak's The Book Thief, Maggie Bergman. In life, there are moments that define who we are and change our perspective forever. It could be something small. You may not even notice that moment at the time. In this story, as World War II rages across Europe, Liesel, a young German girl, experiences a moment that will change her life forever. In that moment, she opens the gates of thievery from The Book Thief by Marcus Suzak. Did the Fuhrer take her away? The question surprised them both, and it forced Papa to stand up. He looked at the brown-shirted men taking to the pile of ash with shovels. He could hear them hacking into it. Another lie was growing in his mouth, but he found it impossible to let it out. He said, I think they might have, yes. I knew it! The words were thrown at the steps and Liesel could feel the slush of anger stirring hotly in her stomach. I hate the Fuhrer, she said. I hate him. And Hans Huberman? What did he do? What did he say? Did he bend down and embrace his foster daughter as he wanted to? Did he tell her that he was sorry for what was happening to her, to her mother, for what had happened to her brother? Not exactly. He clenched his eyes, then opened them. He slapped Liesel Maiminger squarely across the face. Don't ever say that. His voice was quiet but sharp. As the girl shook and sagged on the steps, he sat next to her and held his face in his hands. It would be easy to say that he was just a tall man sitting poor postured and shattered on some church steps, but he wasn't. At the time, Liesel had no idea that her foster father, Hans Huberman, was contemplating one of the most dangerous dilemmas a German citizen could face. Not only that, he'd been facing it for close to a year. Papa? The surprise in her voice rushed her, but it also rendered her useless. She wanted to run, but she couldn't. She could take a Vachin from the nuns and Rosas, but it hurt so much more from Papa. The hands were gone from Papa's face now, and he's found the resolve to speak again. You can say that in our house, he said. 
looking gravely at Liesel's cheek. But you never say it on the street, at school, at the BDM, never. He stood in front of her and lifted her by the triceps. He shook her. Do you hear me? With her eyes trapped wide open, Liesel nodded her compliance. It was, in fact, a rehearsal for a future lecture, when all of Hans Huberman's worst fears arrived on Himmel Street later that year, in the early hours of a November morning. Good. He placed her back down. Now, let us try. At the bottom of the steps, Papa stood erect and cocked his arm. 45 degrees. Heil Hitler. Liesel stood up and also raised her arm. With absolute misery, she repeated it. Heil Hitler. It was quite a sight. An 11-year-old girl trying not to cry on the church steps, saluting the Fuhrer as the voices over Papa's shoulders chopped and beat at the dark shape in the background. Are we still friends? Perhaps a quarter of an hour later, Papa held a cigarette olive branch in his palm, the paper and tobacco he'd just received. Without a word, Liesel reached gloomily across and proceeded to roll it. For quite a while, they sat there together. Smoke climbed over Papa's shoulders. After another 10 minutes, the gates of thievery would open, just a crack, and Liesel Maiminger would widen them a little further and squeeze through. Two questions. Would the gates shut behind her? Or would they have the good will to let her back out? As Liesel would discover, a good thief requires many things. Stealth, nerve, speed. More important than any of those things, however, was one final requirement. Luck. Actually, forget the 10 minutes. The gates open now.
Nicely done, Paul. My name is Tim Leistico, and I am an English teacher, and I have the distinct privilege of getting to work with these amazing student artists. And so I want to give it up for the student artists that we've seen already, but also the ones out in the festival and the tailgate. Thank you for showing up to our first ever tailgate. It was a ton of fun. We look forward to doing it again. I, I didn't do my, um, my selfie station, so I'm going to get this one. And then hashtag FAF 2017 if you have any. Make sure you do that. Um, I'm up here, though, to introduce the next uh, act that we have. Unfortunately, 
it's, it's a video, and I'm going to explain why that is in one second. But I, I do want to give a shout out, because I'm an English teacher, to another English teacher you saw up here, uh, Alexa Bailey, who introduced Maggie Bartman. Let's go for Miss Bailey. Oh, yeah. And Alexa uh, is an example of all the, the staff here for the high school, because we have amazing arts teachers. Uh, and you'll see some of them. You've seen them throughout uh, the show. But we also celebrate the arts and encourage the arts in all of our disciplines. And we're very lucky for the high school to have uh, an overall district uh, vision that says the arts are so fundamental to education, which is why all your donations are very much appreciated. Uh, I teach a class called Theory of Knowledge. And with a buddy of mine I want to acknowledge, Kathy Kramer right over there. Kathy Kramer. <laughs> Kathy and I, yeah. Turn the lights on for Kathy Kramer, darn it. There she is. Kathy Kramer and I teach, uh, or I teach a class called Theory of Knowledge, and Kathy and Kramer and I do a, uh, um, a project in Theory of Knowledge called a TED Ed Talk. How many of you have seen a TED Talk? Yeah. All right, well, good news. If you haven't, you're about to watch an amazing video. And I, I don't want to uh, say anything other than this started here at Fridley High School. Uh, 2016 graduate Annika Paulson uh, started this talk here. Uh, it's a great example why the arts are so vital to education. And I'll let Annika do the rest of the talking. I'm going to ask the uh, uh, crew up there to hit the video. And I wish, I wish we had a live uh, performance, but the next best thing, a video of Annika Paulson. Give it up. So our next speaker actually had a very small starring role in that film. She is a freshman at the University of Minnesota Morris. British, I don't know these things. Uh, and she came to the very first TED Ed weekend last year. It seems like humility is a theme of this session and she blew us away with her quiet charm, her humility and her gentle wisdom. Please give a very warm welcome to Annika Paulson. The philosopher Plato once said, music gives a soul to the universe, wings to the mind, flight to the imagination, and life to everything. Music has always been a big part of my life. To create and to perform music connects you to people countries and lifetimes away. It connects you to the people you're playing with, to your audience, and to yourself. When I'm happy, when I'm sad, when I'm bored, when I'm stressed, I listen to and I create music. When I was younger, I played piano. Later, I took up guitar. And as I started high school, music became a part of my identity. I was in every band. I was involved with every musical fine arts event. Music surrounded me. It made me who I was. And it gave me a place to belong. I remember when I was younger, I always had this thing with rhythms. I'd walk down the hallway of my school, and I would tap rhythms to myself on my leg with my hands or tapping my teeth. It was a nervous habit. I was always nervous. I think I liked the repetition of the rhythm. It was calming. Then in high school, I started music theory. It was the best class I've ever taken. We were learning about music, things I didn't know, like theory and history. It was a class where we basically just listened to a song, talked about what it meant to us, analyzed it, and figured out what made it tick. And every Wednesday, we did something, rhythmic, we did something called rhythmic dictation, and I was pretty good at it. Our teacher, Mr. Pearson, would give us an amount of measures and a time signature, and then he would speak a rhythm to us, and we would have to write it down with the proper rests and notes, like this. Ta, ta, taka, taka, ta, ta, taka, 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 taka. And I loved it. The simplicity of the rhythm, a basic two to four measure line, and yet each of them almost told a story. 
Like, they had so much potential. And all you had to do was add a melody. Rhythm sets a foundation for harmonies and melodies to play on top of. It gives structure and stability. Now music has these parts, rhythm and melody and harmony, just like our lives. Where music has rhythms, we have routines and habits, things that help us to remember what to do and to stay on track and to just keep going. And you may not notice it, but it's always there. And it may seem simple, it may seem dull by itself, but it gives a tempo and a heartbeat. And then things in your life add on to it, giving texture. That's your friends and your family and anything that creates harmonic structure in your life. And your song, like cadences and harmonies and anything that makes it polyphonic. And they create beautiful chords and patterns. And then there's you. You're the melody. Play on top of everything else, on top of the rhythms and the beat, because it's your song. And things may change and develop, but no matter what you do, but it's still the same song. No matter what you do, the rhythms are still there, the tempo, and the heartbeat. Until I left. I went to college and everything disappeared. When I first arrived at university, I felt lost. Don't get me wrong, sometimes I loved it and it was great. But other times, I felt like I had been left alone to fend for myself. It's like I'd been taken out of my natural environment and put somewhere new. Where the rhythms and the harmonies and the form had gone away. And it was just me. Silence and my melody. And then even that began to waver. Because <laughs> I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't have any chords to structure myself. Or a beat to know the tempo. And then I began to hear all these other sounds. And they were off time and off key. And the more I was around them, the more my melody started to sound like theirs. And slowly I started to lose myself. I was being washed away. Then the next moment, I could hear it. And I could feel it. And it was me. different, but not worse off, just changed a little. Music is my way of coping with the changes in my life. There's a beautiful connection between music and life. It can bind us to reality at the same time it allows us to escape it. Music is something that lives inside of you. You create it and you are created by it. Our lives are not only conducted by music, they're also composed of it. And this may seem like a bit of a stretch, but hear me out. Music is a fundamental part of what we are and of everything around us. Now, music is my passion, but physics also used to be an interest of mine. And the more I learned, the more I saw connections between the two, especially regarding string theory. Now, I know this is only one of many theories, but it spoke to me. The string theory, at its simplest form, is this. Matter is made up of atoms, which are made up of protons and neutrons and electrons, which are made up of quark. Here's where the string part comes in. This quark is supposedly made up of little coiled strings. And it's the vibrations in these strings that make everything what it is. Michio Kaku once explained this in his lecture, The Universe in a Nutshell, where he states, string theory, the four forces of the universe, Gravity, the electric and magnetic force, and the two strong forces can be viewed as music. The music of tiny little rubber bands. In this lecture, he goes on to explain physics as the laws of harmony between these, no these strings, chemistry as the melodies you can play on these strings, and he states that the universe is a symphony of strings. 
These strings dictate the universe. They make up everything we see and everything we know. They're musical notes, but they hold us together and they make us what we are. So you see, everything is music. When I look at the world, I see music all around us. When I look at myself, I see music. My, mu my life has been defined by music. I found myself through music. Music is everywhere, and it is in everything. And it changes, and it builds, but it's always there, supporting us, connecting us to each other, and showing us the beauty of the universe. So if you ever feel lost, stop and listen for your song. Thank you.
be silent for our late brother and our great dancer, Legend. pleasure to introduce the next performer. But first, I want to tell you a little bit about some of his recent accomplishments, because he's modest and won't tell you. Um, his outstanding work at this year's Minnesota Scholastic Art and Writing Awards earned him a shot at the national competition, where one gold award would have been a Fridley first, and he received six. Next, next came the Minnesota State High School League, where he earned 12 superior ratings, which the director told me he thought was a league record. <laughs> and most recently, at the Congressional Art Competition, he received top honors, earning him uh, opportunity for two round trip airfares to Washington DC to be recognized at a national reception at the US Capitol. So please join me in giving Amir Kadar a very warm welcome. Hi everyone. Um, my name is Amir. I'm doing good. <laughs> um, so, art has been like a personal journey for me, and I've reached a lot of conclusions about myself and my identity through my art, which speaks to the theme, I make the art, the art makes me. Um, a lot of my art pieces have a big chunk of my identity just like squished in them somewhere. So, um, next slide. <laughs> 
Um, that's the piece that won the Congressional Art Competition. It's going to be at Capitol Hill somewhere. Um, and it's about my history as an African person. Um, my family's from West Africa, Sierra Leone. Um, and I just wanted to talk about my history through my art because there's a lot of times that I'm not given the space to talk about my history as a marginalized person. Next slide. Um, I also, this is about slavery and the transatlantic slave trade and how a lot of the times when we tell stories about the slave trade, we don't put emotions onto African people. Um, next slide. This piece is called The Orishas. It's about an old West African religion called Yoruba. Um, people don't really pay attention to it anymore and it has a whole mythology. It's really beautiful. Then you'll want to look it up. Next slide. <laughs> um, this piece is called I Am Not a Negro. Um, I went to see I Am Not Your Negro and I really loved it. <laughs> and I thought about how stereotypes about black people come from history. And these are all stereotypes that were created essentially by the KKK. And a lot of times people are like, oh, black people love fried chicken, black people love watermelon. But it comes with, it has a lot of history behind the things that we like casually throw around. Next slide. Um, this piece is about how beauty standards are twisted so that white women and white people in general can kind of look the same and all are considered beautiful, but black people are considered ugly regardless of how wherever we look. And we have a lot of beauty to us, not even just in like the little piece of us. We're beautiful people. Next. <laughs> <laughs> Um, this piece is um, really dear to my heart. It is called Don't Touch My Hair. Um, as you can see, I have hair. <laughs> and a lot of people like to just walk up to me and touch it in public, and that's something that really bothers me. Um, another thing about me is that I am a multidisciplinary artist. I mean, I do art across many different mediums, and I'm also a spoken word artist, so I'm going to share a piece. Um, I wrote this piece at the same time that I was making this visual arts piece, and they kind of tell each other's story. Don't touch my hair. At the white girl in the ninth grade who touched my hair without consent, realized I had oil in it, and rubbed it back on my white shirt. I know that Americans don't know how to apologize, because I'm still waiting for any sort of reparations for slavery, Jim Crow, and colonization. But if you stick your hand into my halo and it comes out oily, consider that a blessing. You have $20 worth of argan oil, shea butter, and moisturizing secrets from my ancestors on your dirty, busted, dry hands. The filament of oil on your hands was worth more than your whole being. You should have taken a moment to pray. <laughs> but you rubbed your one chance of redemption back on me. My hair is precious, and you obviously don't understand, so I'll explain it to you slow. Don't touch my hair. This is something that you will never own. Y'all stole my ancestors from their homes, but you cannot quell me. Mother Nature blessed and teased these locks. My hair is so natural that my cornrows are really corn crops, and your unmoisturized hands on my scalp is ruining my land, sucking the moisture from my mud, and my hair drinks and eats, so I feed it well with coconut oil and soul. I would never deprive it. So no. Before you, touch, before you let your hands wander, that my hair is a graveyard for combs and the dreams of white folks. That's why it's so big. My hair strands are more like little nooses because in the moments before a hand violates me, I get the sudden urge to lynch it, cut off all their fingers and wear them around my neck. I woke up at 5 a.m. to look this good and you still want to touch me without my consent? Synthetic or real, it's mine. Chemically treated or natural, it's mine. Under a scarf or dreads, it's still mine. And you need to ask before you touch me, before you touch my prize, or any black persons for that matter. This is magic radiating from a cursed scalp. No colonizer could muster the strength to destroy its pride. So no, when hands wander, so now when hands water, I still, I get, I get flashbacks to when hair like mine was burnt off in lynchings, chopped off and, and outlawed in Louisiana. They still call it unhirable and unprofessional. And to this day, there is not enough value on my black body to ask before you touch my hair. Why would you touch my hair? How privileged are you to think that my body is still your property? How dare you disrespect this altar to my ancestors? This coming from my scalp is the one thing that you could never tame. You wouldn't touch a lion's mane and expect the creature not to bite. But still, you walk up to me, pet me like an animal, dehumanize me, borderline fetishize me, and expect me to sit in your lap and purr in approval. I was never an animal, but maybe you are because nobody taught you any manners. F 
FYI, you can all respect this beauty from a distance. I know that I'm majestical. When I step out of the shower and shake my head, mist meets rays of sunshine and makes rainbows in my bathroom. I'm literally a black unicorn. I'm a new person like every other day. Monday, I got cornrows. Tuesday, wash and go. Wednesday, twist out. Friday, have it under a scarf. Wash, rinse, repeat. This is pinky, curly, low porosity, foresty, and authentic. You can call me the revival of Foxy Brown, the sixth member of the Jackson Five, the child of Solange's dreams, straight out of West Africa realness, and you are dead wrong if you think that you can touch me. Um, I just want to quick say thank you to Ms. Burghart for growing me as an artist. That's Ms. Burghart. Everyone loves Burghart. <laughs> um, she's been an amazing DP art teacher. She like really helped grow my contextual ideas. And in general, art has been extremely important to my development. And if you all have money to give, donate something. Like this is your chance to give to the arts and help grow people. Like all the people that have been on this stage and all the people who weren't on this stage, because we're all amazing. Thank you. <laughs> I have to follow that. Um, I just want to take a quick moment to just thank all of you, but before I do, um, I really want to thank the people that make this room as beautiful and sound as good as it does, or as good as it can, um, when I'm talking at least. Please give it up for our wonderful, amazing tech crew. Up there, back there, out there, thank you. Every year when we get together, as the FAFAF committee to put together this stage show, um, we always say we want to find the acts that are going to wow you. And this year we had state champions, we had national recognition, we had TED Talks, we had an almost perfect score at Solo Ensemble, up and down the line. And each one of these performers would tell you that the arts means so much to them. But the thing that's so cool about the arts is that what means so much to people like Amir mean just as much to those kids that are in the practice room on a Tuesday night trying to bang out the easiest part of band music you've ever heard because they love it and they want to get better at it. So for all abilities, all skill, all performances, and all different areas of the arts, could you please give it up for the artists here at Fridley High School? I have the distinct pleasure of introducing a very special guest for our final act of the evening. Uh, she is an alumni of Fridley High School, 2005. She has performed with virtually every theater in the Twin Cities. And you can see her coming up in Fly By Night at the Jungle Theater, as well as one of the most innovative improv troupes I've ever seen, Blackout Improv. If you would please give a very warm Fridley homecoming welcome to Miss Joy Dolo. back here. Uh, yeah, I graduated in 2005. I just turned 30. The, don't laugh. I just turned 3-0 this year, and I'm so happy that they asked me to come back for this. This is so important. You know, I, I went to Fridley Middle School and Fridley High School, and uh, when I was in fifth grade, I felt really weird, you know? I just felt like I did not belong anywhere. I felt like I was so out of touch with everything that was going around me, as most teenagers do. Um, but I was able to find myself inside of the arts department. I was able to find myself within the theater and the speech and choir and everything that is related to arts. Thanks to Mrs. Leib for and she was a great um, beam in the darkness for me, as well as several others, Kevin Dutcher, Tom Larson, Marsha Chiswick, uh, Gary Zender, several other people that kind of led the way for me. So I'm, I'm really honored to be able to be here tonight and close out the show, and I really hope you like this. If you don't, it doesn't matter, just clap really loud. Thank you. 
So just imagine, just imagine, just imagine. 